Thank you, Seth. And yes, we are back in Ephesians and a glorious passage as well. It's a rather lengthy text, but I try to, as I explained before, try to keep a passage together and follow the, the thought. And this is a great passage on the grace of God that he poured out on the Gentiles and uh, reminds us of the grace he's given to us and the blessings, the privileges into which he has brought us. He reminds the, uh, the Ephesian Gentiles of that. We begin with, verses, uh, with verse 11 of chapter 2, and I'll read through to verse 22. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that he himself might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit." What a great text, and what a privilege to read it, and then to spend some time of study in it together. Let's pray that the Lord will bless us, enable us to understand, and appreciate all that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father, not long ago I stood outside the old city of Jerusalem, and looking to the southeast, I could see concrete, a concrete wall winding over the Judean hills. It was built in desperation to keep terrorists out, and it's been effective. It separates Jews from Arabs, it separates Israelis from Palestinians, and there is a lot of distrust and dislike on both sides of the wall. There was a wall in Paul's day which kept Gentiles out, kept them from Jewish worship and from any inclusion in the nation. There was distrust and disdain on both sides of that wall too. It wasn't concrete. It was a wall of words, the law of Moses. And Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 that a change has come. The wall has been broken down by Christ's sacrifice. He's reconciled the people on both sides, with one another and with God. Christ has established peace between heaven and earth, and on earth He has made friends out of enemies to create a new society of Jews and Gentiles, what Paul calls in our text, one new man. We are all equally in Christ, joined together in a vital relationship with Him. And together we have access to God the Father. 
And all of us are to make use of that great privilege. That's the lesson of the passage. It's another example of the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. And all of the glorious consequences of it, which are all rich blessings. And to show the Ephesian saints the surpassing greatness of that power toward them, Paul began by reminding them of how lost they once were and how desperate their condition was. He's already done that in verse 1 where he wrote that they and we and all believers were originally dead in our sins. But here he reminds them of how far from God uncircumcised Gentiles were. He lists five ways in which they were separated. First, in verse 12, they were separated from Christ. They were in sin and in spiritual darkness with no expectation of the coming Messiah. Living in impending danger and doom without knowing it. Secondly, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. They were Gentiles and unqualified, unfit to be citizens of Israel and come under the government and the protective providence of God. Third, they were strangers to the covenants of promise. They were ignorant of the promise that God had made to Abraham, the covenant that he had made with him, and outside of the covenant that God made with the nation at Sinai and all of the revelation of that covenant, the laws and the principles of it. So not having any part in the covenants, Paul wrote that they were separated from all hope and from God. Well, those are the fourth and the fifth aspects of their separation. Gentiles could not look at the future with any certainty or hope. Many of them were slaves in Roman society with little immediate hope of change in, in life in this present world and no hope beyond this life. Their future was dreary. Their future was dark. Homer in his Odyssey, gives us a glimpse of the, the, the pagan idea of the afterlife. It was in the house of Hades, and Odysseus visits there, and he speaks there with Achilles, the great hero of the Greeks who had perished, and was there and said, better to be a slave on the earth than a king of kings in Hades. Nothing of hope in that understanding of the future after death. The Gentiles were without hope. And Paul added, without God in the world. Literally, that, that, that statement is they were atheists. It doesn't mean they were philosophical atheists. They were simply ignorant of the true God. They had no knowledge of Him and were without peace as a result. William Hendrickson summarized the fivefold separation of the Gentiles as Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. They were alienated from God and men. And that was their future alienation, separation from God and men, isolated and alone for all eternity. No longer that has changed. And Paul introduces the happy news in verse 13 with another magnificent contrast. But now, he said, did that earlier in the chapter, uh, you were dead, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive. And here, you were separated but now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That, that's the amazing grace of God's love and the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. It is the, the power of grace, specifically as explained here, it's the power of the cross. 
It's all of God. In Romans chapter 10, verse 20, Paul quoted Isaiah 65, where this uh, Gentile salvation was prophesied in the, the beautifully ironic words of God, I was found by those who sought me not. It's a way of saying that God did the seeking and finding. He took the initiative. Otherwise, Gentiles will, would still be separated far off and having no hope, but no longer. These Ephesians were brought near by the blood of Christ, Paul said, because on the cross, by the shedding of his blood, Christ settled all accounts with God. He paid our debts, the debts of our sin, in full. The cross is where Christ accomplished salvation for his people. Now, in every generation, he applies that salvation to them through the Holy Spirit, who brings us to faith in Christ, joins us to the Father, into his family, and with one another. And all who believe in him, at that moment, that moment of faith, have peace with God. Or as Paul puts it in verse 14, Christ himself is our peace. Christ, by his death, established peace. That's his meaning, but, but he puts it in this uh, special way by personifying peace and saying, Christ himself is our peace, rather than Christ achieved peace, Christ established peace. peace. He emphasizes the, the personal aspect of his work as peacemaker. It's not enough to believe the facts about Christ, as essential as that is, but we must believe in him personally. We must be joined to him personally in a vital living relationship in order to have peace. He is it. Peace is in him. He alone has reconciled us with God, and especially here, reconciled us not only with God, but with others. This is a great emphasis that Paul is making here in this passage. He made both groups, Jews and Gentiles, into one, made peace between them, and made them into one group. That's the emphasis here, the reconciliation of two very different people. But in order for peace to be a reality between them, much had to be dismantled, as Dr. Harold Honer put it in his commentary. The first thing that needed to be dismantled or broken down was the great wall that divided the two groups. That's how Paul put it. He broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. It's clear from verse 15, where Paul speaks of the law of commandments, that the dividing wall is the law of Moses, with its commandments to be separate and uh, separate from all that is unclean. This instruction to be separate caused enmity, hostility, ill feelings, hatred between Jews and Gentiles. It seems likely that Paul borrowed this picture of the law as a barrier from a literal wall in the temple of Jerusalem that shut out the Gentiles from entering. The entire temple was constructed with a series of courts that became increasingly segregated, increasingly exclusive. There was the outer court, the court of women, where Jewish men and women could be. Then the court of Israel, where only men could enter. Then the court of priests, where the altar was and where only the priests could enter. But the outer court that surrounded the temple was the great court of the Gentiles. Gentiles were allowed there, where they could observe something of Israel's religion but they could not go further than that. And to keep them out, there was a low stone barrier about five feet 
high, which surrounded the temple, and on it was posted a notice in both Greek and Latin forbidding Gentiles to enter on pain of death. In 1871, during an excavation of the site of the uh, Temple Mount, a discovery was made of a white limestone slab on which, which set, was set into this barrier, this wall, with an ins inscription on it. It reads, No foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure round the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Paul had seen that many times. And while the barrier was not the dividing wall that Paul refers to here, it certainly illustrates the separation and the hostility that the law produced on both sides of it. The Jews considered Gentiles and pagans unclean. They were. They were called dogs, pariahs. And the Gentiles looked down on the Jews as peculiar, as strange and antisocial. But Christ, the peacemaker, the Prince of Peace, has changed that. He's broken down the barrier and with it the enmity that it caused, and He has made the two groups into one. In verses 15 and 16, Paul explains how he did that and how he reconciled these, these, these two ancient enemies he did it first by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and ordinances and ceremonies that caused the separation between people. Through his perfect life and sacrificial death, he fulfilled the law and he satisfied the just demands of that law so that all who believe in him, who, who who are joined to Him through faith alone, are counted righteous by God and free from the law and its judgment. God demonstrated this to Peter when he was in Joppa on the Mediterranean coast and had a vision. It's recorded in, in Acts chapter 10. A sheet came down from heaven full of unclean animals and a voice commanded him to kill and eat. Peter protested, but the voice said, What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. In other words, the dietary laws and separation were over. So too the separation between the Jew and Gentile. The moral principles of the law of the Mosaic law have always been God's will for people. Murder, theft, adultery were wrong before the Ten Commandments were given at Sinai, and they still are. And, and the law has relevance for us. We should not think that the law is something bad. We should not think that the law is something that is completely disregarded. It is vital for uh, our, our instruction. It is Scripture. It is the Word of God. We still learn from it. But we are not bound to its ordinances and ceremonies. It was the constitution of the nation Israel. It is not the constitution of the church. It has all been fulfilled in Christ for us. And so, having ended the law as the rule of life for God's people with its regulations of separation, Christ has brought the Jew and the Gentile together into what Paul calls one new man. Not new men, though we are that. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We are new people, men and women in Christ, individually, new creatures, new creation. But here it is singular. It is one new man. That is what the church is. And it's put this way to emphasize the unity that we have in Christ. And this is a major point that Paul is making here and what we need to understand. We are a new society. 
a new humanity. That's what the church is. There's a United Nations in New York that is a, a repeat of Babel. There's no unity there. The real United Nations is here in the church. That was Paul's, uh, that was the purpose, rather, of Christ's death, to create the church by making peace among men between Jew and Gentile and by reconciling them to God. Verse 16, that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. Reconciliation is one of the great words of the Bible. It has the idea of, of bringing enemies together as friends, of establishing peace between them. And so reconciliation assumes a, a previous state of hostility, a state of warfare, what, what is here twice called enmity. It's the word that Paul used in Romans chapter 8, verse 7 to describe the natural man, the unbelieving man's relationship with God. In his mind, he is at war with God. His mind is enmity against God, Paul wrote, or hostility toward God. He will not submit to God. And that was all of us. Sons of disobedience, as Paul wrote back in verse 2 of this chapter. And children of wrath. Meaning our enmity, our hostility, could only end badly for us. Mankind cannot win its war with God. Fortunately, God won the peace for us. At great cost to him, he reconciled us to him through the cross. And there, Paul said, Christ killed the enmity, he himself being our peace. Again, as verse 13, as in verse 13, at the cross, he took on himself the judgment that the broken law required. In that way, he satisfied God's justice so that he can bring, bring us into this freedom that he speaks of, so that we can go free at, uh, at that moment of faith. That's what we are. The moment you believe in Christ, you are free from the condemnation of the law. The moment you believe in him, you are a part of his family. We are no longer children of wrath. We are children of God. We have the, the peace of God, and we have fundamentally the peace with God. And because of that, we have peace with people. Jew and Gentile transformed from enemies to friends. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The war is over for all who believe. And Christ announced that upon his victory at Calvary. We read that in verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Well, that's what the Lord did uh, and said to his disciples Remember when, they, when he appeared to them after the resurrection, that when they were hiding in terror behind closed doors, he came and said, peace be with you. And he continued that message by the Holy Spirit through the apostles and through the church and the missionaries that have gone out throughout the world giving the gospel. He is the Prince of Peace. And he gives that peace to all who believe in him. As a result, because we have peace, we have open access to God Almighty. That is what Paul said in verse 18. We can freely approach His throne of grace in prayer and have fellowship with Him. That access is through Him. It is through Christ. 
It is for both the Jew and the Gentile equally. And it is in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who joins us all together in this oneness, this one new man, this family of God. That's, that is, is a great privilege, but it's an exclusive privilege. Only those in Christ, Jew and Gentiles together, who have been made into one new man, what, what one of the ancient uh, Christians called a third race. Well, how highly do you, how highly do any of us value this great privilege of access to God? It is, it is so easy to neglect it and to forget it. We were praying before we came in, as we always do, and one of the prayers was an acknowledgement that we, we so easily forget the blessings of God's grace and the privileges that we have. And we do. And so again, for the third time in this second chapter, Paul reminds them and reminds us of what they once were in order to appreciate the great privilege that they had been brought into. So then he said in verse 19, meaning because of the changes that have come, they are no longer strangers and aliens. Don't ever forget what you once were and were saved out of and were saved from. Look to the pit from which you were dug, God told Judah in Isaiah 51 verse 1. You who were once strangers and aliens are now fellow citizens with the saints. We are the people of God. We are citizens of heaven with the greatest of the saints. That's who we are. From the pit to the heavenlies. That's what God has done for us. And because of our spiritual citizenship, we have great privileges. We have access to God. I got a sense of that privilege once when I was in Romania. I used to go there uh, usually once a year to visit churches. My first trips were made when it was a communist country. And then in 1989, as many of you will remember, the communist regimes began collapsing across Eastern Europe and then uh, it, the Soviet Union. And suddenly people had freedom and, and they could travel and they could visit the West. And so on one visit, I was asked to help a friend, the sister of one of our members, to get a visa so she could come to Dallas and visit family. To do that, I went to the uh, embassy in Bucharest. Outside the gate were hundreds of Romanians hoping for an opportunity to enter the American embassy and make application for a visa to come here. Uh, some were there, had been there waiting for days. All I had to do was approach the gate, show my passport, and I was given entrance. No waiting, immediate access. I may have appeared to be a very important person to those people waiting at the gate as I, I walked straight into the embassy and got what I was seeking. I wasn't special. My citizenship was special. And our citizenship in heaven gives us the, the greatest rights and privileges in the entire cosmos. We have immediate access to heaven's throne room at any moment where we can seek help in time of need. The wall is broken down and the door is always open to God's children. He is the perfect father. He is the archetypal father and our example. I think there's a lesson in that for all fathers and parents. We should always be available to our children and grandchildren to give them the counsel and the encouragement that they seek and that they need. None of us is perfect in that. Still, the, the care we give to our sons and daughters teaches them a lot about God, 
rightly or wrongly. Paul has instruction on this later in chapter 6. It's an important witness that we have with our family and our children and others. Our Heavenly Father is a caring Father, always accessible. The door is never closed. We can never come too often. He desires our relationship. He invites us to come with confidence in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near, the writer wrote. It's the, the blessing that reconciliation has obtained for us. Use it. We are citizens of heaven. We're members of God's family, His beloved children, His household. Understand that. Take advantage of that. Use it. Now, that is a more personal and warm description of our relationship with the Lord, this word household that Paul uses. Uh, it it in, indicates the intimacy of our relationship. A family is a place of acceptance. A family is a, a haven for a child in this world. And every believer in Christ has that in our spiritual family where we are being encouraged and where we are being strengthened by the Holy Spirit and by the ministry of God's Word. We're being built up through that ministry spiritually within us through the Spirit of God and through the teaching of the Bible. But that household is not only a place of warmth and care, it's also a place of holiness. Paul describes it in verses 20 and 21 with a second picture where the household becomes the temple. We are citizens of heaven. We are God's household. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Jews and Gentiles together are God's temple on the earth. Its foundation is the apostles and prophets. That is New Testament apostles and prophets, not Old Testament prophets. The word order indicates that. These were men who were given revelation before the canon of Scripture was complete. They were necessary and the initial phase of the building of the church. There are no apostles and prophets today. That's a controversial statement. But I think it's indicated very clearly here. The word foundation indicates that. A building has one foundation. It's restricted to the base of the structure. And the apostles and prophets were the first generation of the church until it was established. We are built on their instruction and we are built by their instruction. We're being fitted together. We're being joined together in a unity and we're growing. So we are a living temple and one that must be united in both doctrine and deed. So we need instruction. Paul's final plea to Timothy was not prophesy, but preach. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach the Word. That's how the church grows. Through instruction in the canon of Scripture, through the Word of God, all 66 books of it. And we have a guide. We have a compass in that growth and that establishment, and that is Christ, the cornerstone. Now today, cornerstones are sometimes the first stone that is laid at the time of dedication, uh, rather the uh, uh, last stone, I should say, that's laid at the time of dedication. But in ancient times, it was the opposite. It was the first stone laid. It determined the bearings of the walls throughout the building. The cornerstone of a building gives unity and precision to the structure. And that's what Christ does for the church. The ministry is about Christ. 
We learn from Him. We take our direction from Him. The Old Testament is about Him. We cannot dismiss the Old Testament as irrelevant. It was the Bible of the Apostles. It's a major part of our Bible. And it's about Christ. In John chapter 5, verse 39, he told the Jewish leaders, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Luke wrote that on the Emmaus Road after the Lord's resurrection, he explained to the two disciples the things concerning himself in all the Scriptures beginning with Moses and with all the prophets. Luke 24, verse 27. He is throughout the Old Testament. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, that when he came to that great Gentile city of Corinth, he wrote, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We preach the whole counsel of God. All the doctrines. But at the center of it all is the person and work of Jesus Christ. If He is neglected, the church loses direction and loses its way. When He is preached in all His glory, then the church is nourished. The church flourishes. It's built up. It grows. It matures. I believe that when we preach Christ, His person and work broadly, we will fall in love with Him and with one another, and that, and that will naturally pr produce the unity that is implied throughout this passage. That's how Paul concludes the chapter in verse 22 on this theme of unity. In Christ, in Him, he wrote, you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. I read that the stones of the walls of Byzantium were fitted so closely together that the wall appeared to be as one stone. And that should be the church. This church so united that we appear as one person, one new man, that we appear as Christ. And we can. At the cross, Christ broke down the dividing wall, fulfilled the law that, that separated Jews and Gentiles, brought them together, gave them access to God, and made us into His temple where the Spirit today dwells. John Stott observed that the Ephesians lived between two great temples. There was the temple there in Ephesus, the temple of Diana, a huge pagan edifice, one of the seven wonders of the world. The other temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, was a glorious building. In fact, the rabbi said, he who has not seen the temple in Jerusalem has not seen a beautiful building. But God wasn't in either one. Both were empty. He dwelt in those humble saints in Ephesus and across the globe. God said in Isaiah 57, verse 15, I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. That's us. The world takes no notice of us. And when it does, it's often dismissive of God's saints. But He dwells with us, and He dwells in us. And that is a great privilege. That is a great, great blessing. That's true of every believer in Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile. This again, is an example of the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. So if you've not believed in Christ, but you want such a relationship with God and man, one of peace and growth, then look to Christ. Trust in Him. God will receive you and forgive you and make you one of His saints 
receive you into His household for all eternity, make you a part of this growing temple that is His, and live within you, and live for that world to come, which is a world without end. That's our hope and that's our future. It's all in Christ. So may God help you to come and trust in Him. And you who have, may we all take advantage of the great blessings that we have. Let's stand and sing number 164 in the Red Book. The church is one foundation. 164 and then remain standing for the benediction. Father, we do thank You that we have that glorious hope of dwelling on high with You in glory forever. Uh, what a privilege. But what a blessing and privilege we have in this present life that we can do what we're doing at this moment. Come into the throne room of God Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, Lord of the entire universe, and You have interest in us you hear our prayers and you answer them, not often or not always at least, as we hope, but as is best according to your wisdom. Accepting that is part of the life of faith. Help us to do that. Help us to grow in our faith. And as men and women, young and old, whose faith is in our triune God, we, Father, need to come daily, routinely, to the throne of grace. Help us to do that and take advantage of the great blessings you've given us. We thank you for that. It's all in Christ, all because of his work for us. And we thank you for him. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.